In this video, we will solve the Ising model in the limit of large dimensions. That is, we will describe it by a mean field approach. So let us introduce the basic concepts behind any mean field theory. Every mean field theory consists of three steps. First, the system is described in terms of a model Hamiltonian, which contains some interaction term or coupling. Second, correlation effects are neglected in order to arrive at a new mean field Hamiltonian. Along the way, a mean field and an order parameter are defined. And third, the mean field Hamiltonian is solved, which yields a self-consistency equation. In the simplest case, the self-consistency equation is a transcendental equation. Equation. That is, it can be solved by plotting both sides of the equation. That's what we will obtain for the Ising model. However, for other models, the self-consistency equation has to be solved iteratively. Don't panic if that was too fast. We will now demonstrate each step by means of the Ising model. We have introduced the Ising model from a bird's eye point of view in a previous video. The model describes n sides with two possible states that couple to their neighbors. We can, for instance, consider spins pointing up or down coupling to a magnetic field in z direction. The model Hamiltonian contains two terms. The first term describes localized spins that couple to an external magnetic field. This term alone are non-interacting spins, which we have solved in a previous video. The second term contains coupling of neighboring sides. Let's recall the Hilbert space is spanned by states of all possible configurations of spin up and down at each side. Consider, for instance, the state for nearest neighbors i, j with spin up. When we evaluate the interaction between i and j of this state, we plug in the Pauli matrices written in bracket notation corresponding to our basis. Then we evaluate all the inner products to finally obtain simply minus j as a result. In case of i and j pointing in opposite directions, their interaction term yields j. You can try yourself to obtain the result for both spins pointing down. With this, we fully understand our model Hamiltonian and completed the first step. The second step is to neglect correlation effects. That is, fluctuations at side i do not cause fluctuations at the neighboring sides. What we call fluctuations is the difference of sigma i from the thermal expectation value of sigma. That average, of course, doesn't depend on the specific side. We expand the expression and plug our assumption into the interaction term of the model Hamiltonian. First, we see that the sum over nearest neighbor bonds is the same as summing over all sides and its neighboring sides. However, to avoid double counting, we obtain a factor of one half. Then we notice that the sum over nearest neighbors is a sum over constants, which yields a factor d if d is the number of nearest neighbors. The second term follows the same principle with side j. Note that nothing stops us from renaming j to i now. Finally, the third term doesn't depend on any degree of freedom in the system. Both sums factor out and give rise to a constant offset to the energy. Collecting all the terms yields the new mean field Hamiltonian. First, the unchanged non-interacting part and second, the interaction of side i with the thermal expectation of the surrounding spins. At the beginning, we promise to introduce a mean field and an order parameter along the way. So let's have a closer look. The mean field Hamiltonian actually looks exactly like the non-interacting system, except that we obtain an effective B field. This is the mean field. The measure of how ordered the spins are is the thermal average of the Pauli matrix. Often one would introduce an order parameter m equal minus the thermal average of sigma z. That's because the magnetization is defined as the thermal expectation value of the sum of all local magnetic dipole moments. It is given by 1 over the partition function times the trace over all possible configurations. The argument of the trace is the magnetic moment of a spin 1 half weighted by the Boltzmann factor. Because every side looks the same and the sum can be pulled out of the numeric factor, just like the rest except for sigma z, 
We see that the order parameter m is the magnetization divided by the system size and a numeric factor. That's all we needed to complete step 2. We introduced a mean field, an order parameter m, and obtained a mean field Hamiltonian. The third step is to solve the mean field Hamiltonian. In order to find the self-consistency equation, we need to solve for the observable corresponding to the order parameter. That is, we need to compute the magnetization for the effectively non-interacting system. Here's the solution on a glance. If you don't know how to get there, check out our video about magnetization of non-interacting spins, which is linked in the description. Our final result is a transcendental equation. That means we cannot rearrange it to have m appearing only on one side of the equation. Instead, we have to solve it by plotting both sides of the equation. The left side is simply a line, the right side is the hyperbolic tangent, where the limits go to plus and minus 1. The solutions are where both plots overlap. Let's have a closer look at the case of b equals 0. For high temperatures, the inverse temperature beta is quite small. Therefore, the hyperbolic tangent is flat and the plots only intercept at m equals 0. The paramagnetic phase is stable, that is, all spins point in a random direction. For low temperatures or strong coupling J, the hyperbolic tangent gets intercepted at three points, m equals plus and minus m0, that is finite magnetization, and m equals zero, which is the trivial unstable solution. The system is in a ferromagnetic phase. Given a certain coupling, J, there is a phase transition at some critical temperature, Tc, from the paramagnetic phase to the ferromagnetic phase. That's pretty much it for this video. Thanks for watching!